also means that all chats, including personal one-on-one -on -one chats, are recorded in the chat dialogue. I want to take a couple of moments to share with you some information about our moder moderator today. His bio is quite long and it will be posted on the website later, but it's just too rich for me to skip over a bunch of stuff. So I'll just start with welcoming uh, Dr. Stanley Stone as our moderator today. He was born and raised in Harlem. He received his early education in New York. And as a result of his outstanding athleticism in high school, he was um, awarded over a hundred track and field scholarships. So go Dr. Stone. He didn't hesitate to choose Howard University as his chosen university. And during his tenure there, Dr. Stone was acknowledged as College All-American in track and field. And he received his BS degree in political science with a minor in black history and French. And then he went on to get his law degree at Howard University as well. He relocated to Sanford, Florida and worked as a staff attorney for Central Florida Legal Services. And he was interested in sharing his personal and professional passions. So he ended up working as a professor in business and law for both Seminole State College and Valencia College. And he became the Dean of Legal Studies on the East Campus at Valencia and recently retired after a 38 year highly respected career as VP of Human Resources and Diversity. He is still serving the community and he is bringing, um, has been successful in bringing the police academy to Valencia, where he was asked to have direct oversight for that and the Criminal Justice Institute. And he served in that role for 25 years. He's also a member of 100 Black Men of Greater Orlando. So I want to turn the program over to Dr. Stanley Stone. Thank you so much for being here today. And you're too kind, you know, you didn't have to read all that stuff. It, it was too uh, good as, to miss anything. As far as that check <laughs> stuff is, I have problems walking to the car with bad knees. So I, I understand that. First of all, I want to welcome everybody to, to the Hot Topics uh, segment of, of the league's uh, monthly uh, seminar. And uh, before I get started, Sandy, I want to thank uh, Barbara Lanning, Sue Gilman, and Saudi Ellis who put this all together and has been working with me, trying to get me up to speed. And they've done a great job. And I would hope that you would acknowledge that. And they, they've done really, really a nice job. Um, as far as the topic is concerned, I'm going to tell you five areas in which we are going to, to cover in some form or fashion. One is we're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter. We're gonna talk about defunding the police, excessive police force, de-escalation training, and also the right to protest versus violence. And so those are the things that we're going to be discussing in some fashion. My panel is really, really rich. It could have been a who's who of, of uh, this topic anywhere in the nation. So I'll just read you a little bit about who they are. First, in no particular order, we have attorney Jerry Gurley. And Jerry grew up in Los Angeles. He came to Florida in 1979 while serving in the United States Navy. After serving in the Navy, he worked for the Orlando Police Department as a civilian for eight years. While working at the department, he also studied to become a licensed minister of the gospel. In 1987, he was licensed to preach the gospel from that time until the present. One thing I'll say is his experience as a civil rights lawyer has allowed him to serve as a commentator on television and radio tackling current events such as Trayvon Martin tragedy and, and police brutality. Currently, he is the president and managing attorney of Gurley Law Firm, as well as the president of the National Center for Justice and Peace. And I do appreciate Jerry and all that he brings to this discussion and to the community. Next is Sheriff John Mina. And let me say that not only was he elected in 19... I mean, in 2018, I congratulated him on being reelected. I think that's appropriate um, to share for another term. John has dedicated his whole life to public safety. He spent nearly 28 years with the Orlando Police Department where he rose through the ranks and was appointed chief of police in 2014. For more than four years, he commanded 11, I'm sorry, 1,000 sworn 
civilian and OPD personnel and 100 volunteers. The voters, as I said, elected him on November 29th to be the next sheriff. I wanna say something about John just for a moment. Prior to entering law enforcement, John proudly served his country as a member of the 82nd Airborne Division of the United States Army as a military police officer. And there's a lot you'll see on John's uh, bio that's much more impressive, but we won't read you know, all of his attributes there. Then we have or attorney Orlando Rolon. And Orlando is the current police chief of the city of Orlando. He grew up in Puerto Rico and permanently moved to Central Florida with his family in 1977. He grew up in the city of Orlando, going to Inglewood schools where he attended Stonewall Jackson Middle School and Colonial High School. And then on 19, in November the 8th, 1992, telling your age now, Chief, he began his career with the Orlando Police Department and served under the leadership of four chiefs of police. During his career, he served a combined total of 11 years as part of the chief's executive staff. Chief Rallone worked and supervised in all four department bureaus, including nine of 11 divisions. He has worked with the mayor, the city commissioners to make Orlando safe. Thank you, Orlando, as well. And then we have attorney Kevin Anderson and Anderson. Kevin Anderson, and I'm looking two different things, is a resident partner of Anderson and Welch LLC in West Palm Beach, Florida. He practices exclusively in the areas of criminal litigation and police brutality. Mr. Anderson is always possessed of passion for criminal justice. He earned his bachelor's degree in criminology with honors from FSU and his doctorate from Syracuse School of Law. He gained invaluable experience while working with the Miami-Dade Office of Public Defender he then practiced as a trial attorney at Palm Beach Office of the Public Defender. One thing he says that I'm sure he would want me to mention is as a criminal attorney, Mr. Anderson recognizes the injustice arising from abuse of governmental power and abuse of authority by civil rights violations. A true advocate for justice, we thank uh, Mr. Um, Kevin Anderson. So thank you, Kevin, I really appreciate that. We're gonna get on and again, you'll see their bios later on um, that's gonna be posted from my understanding. We each have an opportunity to ask the top cop, as they say, about some things that are happening in the nation. But what I will say is, cause I think it's important as a housekeeping, one of the questions that we will not entertain is anything specific to their agency in terms of any incident or ongoing investigations as we know it. That is not why we're here. There's a process in place. If, if people have questions about that, and I'll be glad to talk with them offline to guide them to the chief or to the sheriff. So the first question for all of you is, what does Black Lives Matter mean to you? And we're gonna start that with uh, Sheriff Mina. Oh, uh, thank you to, uh, first thank you to the League of Women Voters and, and Dr. Stone and to other panelists for having this uh, very important discussion. And, and I will say um, Black Lives Matter to me means simply just that, Black Lives Matter. And it goes far beyond uh, those three words. I think um, everyone can agree in this country that um, that, that segment of our, of our population has felt uh, marginalized, has felt uh, abused um, by not only law enforcement, by government in general. You know, I, as a 30-year uh, lawman, uh, I have you know, risked my life for all uh, races and, and colors and creeds and, and will continue to do so. And so will the men and women of the Orange County Sheriff's Office. But we do need to empathize uh, with um, that movement and, and see uh, things from uh, that perspective. And when you see some of the, uh, the incidents um, that have, have played out uh, on TV nationally and heard of some of the stories, uh, we understand you know, why uh, there, there is that movement, why there is that feeling. And we need to get to a place in this country uh, where everyone is uh, treated equally 
and I, you know, I, I support that the people's freedom um, uh, of expression and and everyone's opinion. And um, and while we all not may agree on certain uh, incidents and in certain cases, certainly we can agree that uh, in this country, um, specifically Black Lives. Um, have not mattered as much when you look at the, the, the hundreds of years of history uh, of our country. And uh, although I think we have come a long way, uh, we still need uh, to go a little further. And I think that uh, starts and continues with uh, education and listening um, to everyone uh, and their concerns. And, you know, as sheriff, I, I will do my part in that and help spreading that message. Ralone, same question. What does Black Lives Matter mean to you? So I think we should all recognize it as an outcry from our Black community in our nation, basically feeling the pain of not being treated equally as a member of this great nation, right? Being Hispanic, I can tell you that I know what it's like to be treated different. I know what it was like to watch my parents being treated different when we first came to uh, Florida from Puerto Rico. And for the law enforcement profession, although we're very proud, we're very proud of what we do and we overwhelmingly support the work, the great work that law enforcement does, we must recognize that history has shown that there are some members of our profession who have not done so honorably have not served our citizens honorably. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement highlights the importance to recognize that although we are proud of our profession, we must also understand that the concerns that uh, portions of our community have expressed are valid and there is merit behind those concerns. So to what the sheriff said, um, John said, as far as uh, the goal, ultimate goal here, I think we must never forget the past that has led us to the point where we're, at, where we're now in history. But I think we also need to uh, consider the fact that we must reach that common ground, that we must focus on what it is that will unite us moving forward so that we don't allow for the past to be repeated and I think that is the one part that we hope our nation sees and understands that the law enforcement profession, the leadership in law enforcement, and regardless of the organization that is a representation of the law enforcement profession, more so now than ever, has recognized that we must address this. We must do our best to move forward and make sure that we do things right. Attorney Gurley. Well, there are many things that come to mind when I uh, think about the term Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> it can be, in one sense, posed as a question. Does Black Lives Matter? I mean, that's a question that Black people are posing to the United States of America. But I think what it really is, is a statement that says Black Lives Matters too, as in also, or Black Lives Matter as much as all other people's lives. So when I think about that statement, I think that it is a response, it is a reply, it is a retort, it is a rebuttal to what we've been explicitly told as people of color, what we have been implicitly told, what we've been symbolically shown or figuratively shown, that our lives do not matter. And I think specifically about a case as a lawyer uh, the case of Dred Scott, which was uh, decided in 1857, uh, where Dred Scott was challenging uh, the fact that he was a slave. And the Supreme Court came down on the side of the slave owner. But the language of that decision is one that I think every American should familiarize itself with, himself or herself with. What the court said in rationalizing keeping Mr. Scott in slavery is that black people are not citizens, are not actually human beings, but are beings of an inferior order. That's the exact language that's used in that decision. Altogether unfit to associate with white people, socially or politically, so far inferior that white 
people do not have to respect any rights that black people have. Now, when you look at that language that is actually right in a decision of the United States Supreme Court, when you look at what's happening in terms of George Floyd, uh, Fernando Castile, Breonna Taylor, if you look at it through the lens of that language in the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case, then it makes some sense that at the beginning, at the inception, in the foundation of this nation, we're making these characterizations of African Americans that say, and I want to quote again, that we are beings of an inferior order. So what does Black Lives Matter mean to me? It means that we are saying, no, we are not beings of an inferior order. What does Black Lives mean to me? It's saying that as it relates to Article I, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, which deemed us to be three-fifths human. No, we are not three-fifths human. We are fully human in every respect, and we must be treated and accorded and afforded the rights of all other American citizens. So it's a retort. It's similar to the, the saying in the 70s, Black power. The majority population in the 70s thought of that as a uh, attempt to uh, overpower, but actually this was a statement that was made as a result of black people feeling powerless. Or I'm black and I'm proud. That's James Brown also in the, in the 1970s, right? But it wasn't just that black people should be proud to be black above all other people, but again, in response to the fact that what this country has said to us is that we are beings of an inferior order. No, I am not. In fact, I'm black and I'm proud. So that's the lens through which I see Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Thank you Jerry. Attorney Anderson, same question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanna uh, thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me to the panel today. Uh, the Black Lives Matters movement was actually founded by three black women. And uh, some people don't know that, but I, I wanted to, to put that out there because we are occasioned here today because of women. And uh, um, it's, it's important to understand that the movement itself uh, was uh, founded uh, based upon two principles, uh, the intervention of uh, against violence towards black people by state actors and vigilantes. And in addition, it was also founded to eradicate the systemic oppression of black people. So um, I can tell you that what it is not, the movement is not an indictment against non-black people. Um, you know, of late we're seeing the Black Lives Matters uh, movement uh, juxtaposed against an All Lives Matters movement. And again, uh, the Black Lives Matters movement has never said and does not endorse uh, a only Black Life Matters position. Um, what the Black Lives Matters movement does is it attempts to not minimize the problems raised by its proponents that uh, address structural racism in uh, the country in which we live. Uh, specifically, there are issues that happen to black people in black communities that don't happen in other communities. And uh, the movement itself was uh, founded to raise an awareness about these issues and also to mobilize thought and to mobilize efforts in order to address these specific issues that are plaguing black people in black communities. Thank you, Attorney Anderson. Is there any other panel want to have a comment on that about anything someone said, or we can move on to the next question? All right. So the next question that I would have, or the league would have, is here lately we're hearing about a term called defunding the police. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. And, you know, I've heard that defunding the police means get rid of all the police. We don't need police. That's one. Two, let's call the National Guard and let them police us. Three, let's take the money and resources given to the police and give it to, take it from them and give it to social services. But that's just a conversational thought. And so therefore, let me ask uh, Chief Rallone to go this time and talk about defunding the police and then Sheriff Mina. 
I think our part of our problem in our nation is that we tend to coin terms or adopt terms that sometimes need better defining uh, before they're pushed out to the masses and or better definitions before they're pushed out to the masses and more information should be shared in the process. We all obviously now recognize the fact that defunding does not mean that we want to eliminate a law enforcement agency or police departments across our country, our country. but initially that's pretty much how many people in our country were interpreting that. And of course, um, when it comes to the reallocation of funds to, from, from, that were set to go to law enforcement agencies to support programs that will minimize uh, the police citizen contact whenever possible, to support services that will potentially save someone from having to um, come in contact with the law enforcement or judicial process. That, of course, we as a profession welcome. But I think in part, initially, when this term began to uh, come about, um, a lot of people were confused as to what exactly that meant to include the members of the law enforcement profession. I think we need to be mindful moving forward of how we define uh, things that are meant to be good for everyone in our country. Chair of Nina. Yeah, so I, you know, and you hit the nail on the head in your question. Lately, we've heard this uh, this term. I've been in law enforcement for 30 years, and um, it really hasn't come to the forefront until now. And because of some some national incidents, specifically the George Floyd incident, but I think defunding uh, the police um, is is very short sighted and really needs to be uh, looked at and carefully uh, studied before we just say, well, let's just cut the sheriff's budget. Let's just cut the police department's budget. Because what people are talking about when they talk about defunding the police, they're talking about taking funds away from law enforcement and the safety of this community and putting them towards um, all those services that need um, uh, help, such as you know, homelessness, uh, education, um, drug and alcohol abuse, right? And those are all very, very important services, but we cannot fund those at the expense of law enforcement because those programs um, need tens and tens of millions of dollars, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. And the only way to get to that at, when you're talking about uh, cutting funding from law enforcement is to cut personnel and staff. And that is going to affect response times. That's going to affect uh, all these great programs that we have at our law enforcement agencies. That's going to affect training. So both the Orlando Police Department and the Orange County Sheriff's Office, uh, um, we trained uh, about 40 years, uh, 40 hours every year. Uh, the state only mandates that you train 40 hours every four years. So when you're talking about defunding the police, you're talking about cutting down training and we won't be able to go to the de-escalation training or the fair and impartial training because we need deputies and officers out on the street to respond uh, to those calls for service. Thanks, Attorney Anderson, any comment on defunding the police? Sure. Uh, I think that uh, the, the, the term has been defined uh, uh, based upon who you ask. Um, essentially of late, uh, that term has been taken out of context and uh, politicized. Uh, the uh, term defunding the police, I believe, uh, addresses a reallocation of resources and a, a reformatting of law enforcement operations to better serve our community. Um, and um, it's a concept, essentially, a concept that takes into consideration both the reformation of police agencies defunding, and in addition, in some instances, disbanding police agencies. Now, um, no one's asking that uh, the police agencies be eliminated. Abolishment is, uh, is not what's being said, but clearly there is a need for some degree of uh, reallocation so that the issues that affect us all are uh, are, are addressed, and, and, I, and I echo Sheriff Mina, and I also echo uh, um, uh, Chief Roland with respect to some of those areas regarding uh, mental health issues, uh, uh, de-escalation training, but I would add to that community relations and recruitment of personnel as well. 
Attorney Gurley, any comments on defunding the police? Sure, I, I think that different people mean different things. And, and quite frankly, I have heard people who meant exactly what it says. Um, that they don't think that the police are up to the task of meeting uh, the needs, the holistic needs of, of the community and maybe some other type of public safety entity must be formed and that police would be a component of that, but not charged with the total responsibility of uh, providing all of the safety functions. So that's not what I think about. But I think, we again, we have to look at who's saying this. This is coming from African Americans and other uh, people of color who feel as though the police have not been there to protect them, uh, who feel as though they've been victimized by the police, not helped by the police, hunted by the police. And so we have to set that in context. So it is a cry that is born out of frustration and anguish. Uh, now we know as a practical matter that we're not going to defund the police, but it also calls into question or to sharp focus that over the years, over the last 40 years, we have asked the police department to do more and more and more and more things that really, if we're being fair to them, they should not actually be required to do. And one of those uh, narrow and specific areas is mental health. I think about what happened in Rochester last week or week before. The police were called to the scene of a man who was having a mental health crisis. Uh, he ended up uh, dying as a result of asphyxiation. As I imagine uh, refunding or defunding, I would say refunding or reallocating the police resources, is that perhaps there needs to be a specialized unit that is called out under those circumstances. And that unit doesn't necessarily have to be or probably shouldn't be the police. There are other communities that do have such specialized units and they work very effectively. So I think it's incumbent upon the community to look at what our resources are and how they're best spent. Not focusing entirely on the police, but not excluding them from the conversation about how we're going to best use our resources. Thank you, Attorney Gurley. Um, the third subject we want to talk about is the one that's on everybody's mind in every city and every household. And that's about excessive police force. Whether or not force has to be used, whether it be deadly, whether it not be. And I think Sheriff mentioned, you know, uh, George Floyd, and I know Chief mentioned George Floyd. My question is this, since George Floyd's killing, I'm going to say that, since George Floyd's killing, what has the Orlando Police Department and the, Orlando, and the Orange County Sheriff's Office done about reviewing their excessive force policy. And uh, Sheriff, you go first and then we'll yeah, ask sure, the Chief. Sure, Dr. Stone, uh, great question. Um, and yeah, I think uh, myself and Chief Alone were uh, two of the first law enforcement leaders in this area, maybe even the state of Florida, to come out quickly and denounce the actions of those former officers in Minneapolis uh, that resulted in the killing of George Floyd. Uh, so right after that, we were you know, flooded uh, by the community uh, with all kinds of questions and, and ideas and suggestions and uh, about you know chokeholds and no-knock warrants and uh, the duty to intervene. And um, I, what I noticed, and I, I'm sure Chief Alone noticed a lot, uh, we are two of the most progressive agencies in the nation, meaning that all those ideas and suggestions that were coming in, uh, we already, we've had those in place for years. And so, but, but to further that, to, to ensure that we were being the best that, that we can be at the Orange County Sheriff's Office, we decided that we would have, um, based on some of those suggestions from not only locally here, but nationally, we had our Citizens Advisory Committee um, you know, meet uh, for months uh, since this incident and look at our use of force policy from top to bottom. Um, and they made recommendations 
um, to the sheriff's office. And we're also looking internally uh, to change a number of things. But like I said, a number of those things, suggestions from across the country, a ban on chokeholds, you know, no knock warrants. Those are things that we already had in place. Um, so the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, came up with a number of recommendations um, to really clear up a lot of the language and make it crystal clear that deputies had the duty to intervene uh, if they saw excessive force or if they anticipated excessive force that uh, what exactly is a chokehold and that yes it is banned as well um, so those are some of the suggestions that came in we are continually adapting and changing our policy based on the best practices around the country and many of those um, policies that we have are in place are because of uh, the national consensus on the use of force, uh, you know, experts from uh, all the, the major law enforcement organizations, major city chiefs organization, major county sheriffs, the Police Executive Research Forum and the International Association of police, Chiefs of Police long ago came up with this national consensus on the police use of force. And uh, I think the people in our community should be happy to know that uh, these two progressive agencies have been doing many of those things uh, for years. Chief Lone. Dr. Stone, so uh, like the sheriff, I've had the opportunity to serve in different uh, committees or subcommittees to provide guidance for other law enforcement agencies uh, here in the state and of course uh, the sheriff across the country. And just recently, our uh, state of Florida, for Florida Police Chiefs Association set up a committee, drafted a report with recommendations for the 900 agencies that are members of, of this association. And the board voted to um, suggest that everyone implement the things that, like the sheriff mentioned, we have been doing for many years. A lot of people don't realize that there is a difference also between use of force and excessive use of force, right? So the cases involving excessive use of force are very rare, especially in this community. But um, a lot of people don't know, in 26, uh, 2013 or so, we had about 600 uses of force where officers had to use some aside from handcuffs or just a peaceful arrest process where they have to use chemical spray or what have you. Today, we, this, or last year, we used, there were 300 of those incidents, less than 50% of the total incidents uh, that we reported six years ago. The number of arrests, 5,000 less than what we reported six years ago. So there's been a decline in that type of activity, but unfortunately, the messaging that often is heard is not uh, aligned with that. To the sheriff and to the chief, when you review your use of force and excessive force policies, how are you going to communicate that to the community? So at the sheriff's office, um, all of our uh, policies are online, including our use of force policy. And then you know, we took it uh, a step further. Uh, all, of my, all of our deputy involved shootings for the past five years are documented online at ocso.com and we just recently put all of our uh, use of force incidents for the past uh, four years on uh, ocso.com as well so all those statistics are out there i think it's important to note that you know we uh, arrest um, nearly twenty five thousand people a year uh, in orange county and uh, we are only using force on one out of every 100 people that we arrest uh, so about 1%. So why is that important? It's because that um, people need to understand that when you follow the instructions of law enforcement, when you comply with the instructions of law enforcement, these cases will end peacefully. We arrest hundreds and hundreds of people with um, illegal firearms uh, every single year. And 99.99% of those instances are resolved peacefully and there's no need to use any force because people comply with the instructions of law enforcement. So when, um, to answer the first part of your question, uh, once the final uh, recommendations are complete, we'll definitely put that out to the public. Uh, I know media outlets have already uh, reported on the recommendations from our citizens advisory committee as well. We'll put, we'll put a final message out um, to the community so everyone is in the loop and know what, exactly what changes we have made. Keep it along. So during the Obama administration, the Orlando Police Department was one of the 
first agencies to actually request to be included in the police data initiative where um, during uh, Sheriff Mina's leadership and our, our command staff here, we did everything in our power to be proactive in publishing our data to include officer involved shootings, calls for service, but we collect a lot of data that unfortunately we don't use to our benefit. And I think what we're gonna be doing uh, moving forward is capitalizing on that to put up dashboards so that people can see for themselves the number of incidents involving um, situations between law enforcement officers and members of, the, of our community that we're serving and what that interaction is like to include vehicle stops, to include use of force outcomes and what have you. That's where we're headed moving forward. Before I give to uh, Attorney Anderson and uh, Attorney Gurley, a question came through just on that subject from I guess one of the attendees. You both mentioned you have a citizens advisory committee and you have a citizens review board, but there is an appearance that they're not taken very seriously. I mean, it says that, you know, y'all gonna do what you're gonna do anyway. And, you know, it's just kind of going thrown through the motions. And they ask that you please take more serious teeth into these, uh, to the citizens review board and their recommendations. So I just put that out there and no need to comment unless you, unless you want to. But let me ask uh, attorney Kevin Anderson, whose practice is about police brutality and police force, if you want to comment on that, uh, Kevin. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, you know, my citizens advisory and review board is called a jury. Uh, six or 12 people assembled to determine the facts and to give us a decision about whether or not uh, there has been excessive force. Um, you know, these reports, these councils and these committees uh, seem to be a think tank that doesn't translate to the saving of lives and the prevention of serious bodily injury in our communities. And uh, quite frankly, I believe uh, de-escalation and de-escalating de-escalation training is probably needed more so uh, than anything with respect to what's happening in the streets. Uh, because you're talking about law enforcement uh, who are in a fluid situation and they are in need of an alternative uh, to uh, handling individuals where we're talking about the situation is, is, is just a, a flash in a moment. Um, the recognition, for example, of a person who's mentally ill or an individual who maybe is medically incapable of responding to what the police are asking he or she, that person to do, or maybe even a language barrier here in Florida or the fear or sometimes intoxication, those are things that serve as an impediment to communicating to the person what you're asking that individual to do. And I think if law enforcement were trained more adequately in recognizing some of these impediments in order to kind of back up and to give the situation the time and the distance and the tactical flexibility so that the, the event more likely than not would not result in a fatality or serious bodily injury, I think that's where we need to go. Uh, but uh, uh, accountability is there, I think, which uh, serves to dissuade law enforcement from doing some of the things that continue to happen, despite these committees or these councils or these reports, uh, when an individual has to answer for what happens, I think that changes the decisions that are made before the occurrence takes place. Uh, so, um, you know, I know I'm limited in my time, but, you know, I, I, I definitely have a lot of thoughts with respect to what can take place concerning uh, these use of force policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Rallone, you wanted to share that comment you sent to me about the challenge that you have in regards to that? You're talking about morale? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I think the biggest thing that we are going to have to confront is how the lack of the ability for us to deal with the messaging in social media and how that message is not vetted, but yet it has the power to influence the masses to the magnitude that none of us probably would have ever imagined five years ago even, right? So between social media and um, traditional media and the way that they're they're covering um, the actions of law enforcement officers. 
I think for us will continue to be a challenge, although we have to uh, acknowledge, obviously, when something is not done right, that we own up to it. Unfortunately, the good things are not being addressed. Yesterday, four officers of the Orlando Police Department jumped into a retention pond where a car had left the road and unfortunately crashed into the pond. Drive, uh, a sergeant dove into the car repeatedly trying to find the driver, could feel a body inside. Eventually got the ankle of the person, the driver pulled the person out and the person was taken to the hospital with a pulse. Unfortunately, that person died, but how much coverage did we receive for the actions of those officers yesterday? Very little. How much coverage is there being given to it today? Very little. And that's what we have to contend with every day. There are a lot of heroics that are being um, done by our officers every day, but unfortunately, the coverage that we're receiving is not balanced. And Dr. Stone, I would, uh, I would yes. tend to agree with that. You know, our, our law enforcement officers, uh, when the pandemic struck, they didn't have uh, the luxury of doing Zoom meetings. They were out there on the streets, uh, ex possibly exposing themselves and their families um, to that. And then we went right into uh, the protests and some of the unrest after the George Floyd killing. And I think uh, many in our profession are feeling vilified for the actions of a few. And you know, let's not let's not forget uh, these are men and women who go every single day and uh, risk their lives for this community. And we have had officers and deputies killed in the line of duty in this community uh, by criminals that wish to do them harm. We cannot ever forget that. And we and we we have to remember that um, you know, although our public um, should demand excellence in law enforcement you got to remember we're human, right? We make mistakes. So the, the challenge for us is, uh, you know, recognizing that there is always room for improvement, that we need to get better, that yes, there needs to be criminal justice reform, uh, but criminal justice reform doesn't happen overnight. Uh, criminal justice reform is complex and takes time. And law enforcement does need to be given a little credit for uh, this, the incremental steps that we have taken, especially over the last decade, uh, body warrant cameras, uh, officers uh, and law enforcement officers now being charged with crimes and excessive force where uh, that the percentage of that happening in the past was very small. Uh, so as a profession, uh, remember that uh, we are here to protect and serve, uh, but we are not perfect. And But the law enforcement leaders are holding those uh, very few people um, accountable for their actions. Thank you, Attorney Gurley. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to speak on the use of force because a part of your practice is that as well. So if you'll take a few minutes and speak to that. Well, from my vantage point, the issue is not that there's use of force because we understand there's circumstances that the officers are presented with that requires some form of force. The issue is excessive force. And more narrowly and more specifically, the issue is who's uh, the recipient of this excessive force and what we find and what the Black Lives Matter movement is about and what the, the current public outcry is about is that people of color, black and brown people, but especially African-American males are disproportionately the recipients of this excessive force. So that's the problem that we are confronted with Let's make no mistake about that. I would want to respond to something that uh, Chief uh, or the Sheriff Mina said, that when people comply, then uh, violence is not usual. That hasn't been my experience. That hasn't been my, my observation. I think for the most part, that holds to be true. But there are instances. And, and just look at George Floyd. On the ground, handcuffed, with a knee on his neck, what more could he have done to comply? Let's look at Elijah in Colorado, who was a black male whose only crime was walking home in a mask in a cold environment, and someone called and said he looked suspicious. And he's standing there, he's not doing any resisting, and they use ketamine, slows down his heart, he dies a week later. What more could he have done? So. It's not my observation, it's not my belief that every single time a citizen complies with the request of the police officers that 
no physical harm um, comes because I think that it does happen. Now, there's another issue, and, and I would agree with the, sh the chief and the sheriff that for the most part, the overwhelming majority of law enforcement officers do their job and they do it uh, in, in conformance with the law. So that's, that's not an issue. But for those who don't do it, who do in fact regularly use excessive force, the issue becomes what are the other officers who's observed that what is their responsibility? That has been an issue uh, through the years that the, the quote unquote good officers are silent because they don't want to uh, cross that blue line, okay? And then in terms of uh, advisory boards, uh, by definition, that's the problem. An advisory board has no authority. I know that police are very reluctant and very resistant to this concept, but I'm a firm believer that there has to be independent oversight with subpoena authority to hold law enforcement agencies accountable. It is incumbent upon every local community, especially the elected officials, to set the boundaries and the parameters in terms of how force will be used in that specific community, especially lethal force. And once those boundaries are set, then it is incumbent upon the elected officials to communicate their expectations to law enforcement. And lastly, I would say that we need to have transparency. I'm happy to know that, that the different law enforcement agencies in Central Florida is collecting data on the excessive use of force or force being used, whether it's excessive or not. But we need details. And we need it in terms of quarterly or semi-annual reports that are made available to the public online without having to pay an enormous amount of money because that's typically what you have to do now. If you want to get information about a police shooting, you have to pay uh, for the cost of copying the documents. I recall trying to do that at once and having to pay $890 to get the documents on one shooting. It's prohibited. It's meant to be prohibited. So there has to be some transparency there. There has to be some accountability we, didn't, we need to know who's doing the shooting in terms of their race, whether or not they have done uh, prior, were involved in prior shootings or prior instances of excessive force. We need to know who's being shot or who's being the recipient of, of this excessive force because the objective data will tell us what we need to do. But there's been a reluctance to share this information, even to collect this information, and we need to move in that direction. Thank you. Um, yeah, kind of running. Now. Um, I know that I, I see my timekeepers. We just have time for one more question, and that is: let's talk about the right to protest versus violence. You know, we see a lot of things happening now with the right to protest, peaceful protest, but then violence or looting ensues. So let me start with uh, Kevin Anderson. The right to protest is so important in our society. Uh, expressing oneself is uh, the ability to address what is happening um, uh, by government. And um, uh, what we are, are seeing now is a suppression of that right to express oneself. And that's a problem. Uh, it's a problem when, uh, as a citizen, uh, individuals cannot go uh, peace peacefully uh, in the streets and to raise their voices or to assemble without being afraid of law enforcement. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's quite a chilling factor uh, when you are confronted by law enforcement uh, wearing a riot helmet, uh, military uniforms, uh, you're, you have uh, these shields and, uh, you know, these bulletproof vests that are on the outside and, and long guns and long batons and mace and rubber bullets uh, and you're, like stormtroopers trying to dispense the crowd before they even begin to do anything. Now, you know, there's something known as uh, time, place, and manner restrictions or limitations. Um, now, I I'm not talking about a censorship, but I am talking about uh, just using common sense as a police agency to like understand that there will be issues and there will be responses to those issues in a society. So, you know, think about it in advance and prepare like an ops plan, so that uh, I believe you can anticipate a problem and you can now facilitate 
without controlling the content of the protesters' activity, um, some form of orderly expression. Um, you know, it, the, the case law is real clear that as long as you don't stop the, 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 the content of what the protesters are saying, and as long as there's an important governmental interest with respect to what you are trying to limit, and if you provide an ample outlet for these protesters to convey what they want to say, it's okay. I mean, we're smart enough, you know, uh, you know there are enough degrees on this, on this panel uh, to bust the thermometer. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, you know, we, you can put it together so that like people are able to speak and the governmental interests are met. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Mina, for just posting your internet that says all of the Orange County deputy involved shootings, you can look at them online. And he just sent that over the screen. So if you need to get that, we can get that to you later on if anybody wants it, but he just posted it. Um, comment, Chief Rallone regarding uh, protest versus violence? So we're probably in the range of about 40 to 50 protest uh, demonstrations that have taken place here in the center of the city of Orlando downtown. We have facilitated um, every one of those to include early on during the initial um, demonstrations approximately a 10 mile track, the equivalent of walking from here to Universal Studios and almost walking from downtown to the airport, all peacefully until the very end on four occasions. So we have about 40 to 50 demonstrations, all have been facilitated, traffic has been stopped, intersections have been taken over, individuals have, we have pleaded with the organizers to please work with us so that we can uh, provide a safe route. But unfortunately, early on, we had some individuals that contrary to everyone else who was participating in it, one of those, we had over 10,000 people. Unfortunately, those individuals capitalized on the opportunity to bring something negative to the demonstration. And I think that's the challenge that law enforcement agencies have faced um, during uh, some of these demonstrations that the majority of the people mean well, but unfortunately, there's always gonna be a group that it's not intending to do that when they demonstrate, but we'll continue to try to facilitate them as much as possible. Yeah, so I'll echo that. So in, in Orange County in Orlando here, we have a strong history of letting people peacefully protest. Both Chief Rallone and I have marched with protesters going back to 2016, we marched with Black Lives Matter um, protesters. Uh, we've knelt with protesters. We've blocked roads and, like you said, uh, let peaceful protesters express their frustration, practice their First Amendment rights. Um, but what we have held strong on here, as I think all communities should, is that we will not let violence come into our communities. We will not let businesses be looted. And uh, we did have some businesses damaged um, shortly after the, the protest started in the George Floyd incident. Uh, we're, we're just not gonna tolerate it. And we're certainly, certainly not gonna allow violence of any type and definitely not gonna allow violence to officers or deputies. Uh, you know, we've had officers and deputies hit with rocks and bottles. Uh, I know uh, we've had um, some serious events where um, you know, we're, we're continuing to have protests almost every day. And we had a protester um, about a week and a half ago bring a gun to a peaceful protest. So that's something that we're not gonna tolerate in our community. And like I said, there, there's people protesting out in front of the sheriff's office the other day. You didn't see anyone in riot gear. Um, but um, when we are confronted with people who are going to commit violence uh, towards people in our community or property damage to our businesses and our business owners who works hard, uh, we're not going to tolerate that. And we will do whatever we can to stop that. But it is a challenge you know, in those same forms to let people peacefully protest. I mean, if you look at some of the things that are happening um, in Portland, they're literally throwing pyrotechnics and fireworks at the police. Um, you know, that is not a peaceful protest and, you know, that, that can't be tolerated in, in any society. In the spirit of transparency, Chief Malone just put up his website that says any officer involved shooting can be located at that particular website. So there you have 
to uh, websites that speak specifically to the officer involved shooting. So thanks Chief Alone and, and Sheriff Marino for doing that. And uh, Jerry Gurley, this is uh, gonna be the last one and then I'm gonna get everybody a one minute to kind of wrap it up because Barbara is gonna choke me. And that is, uh, how about you talk about protest versus violence? Well, according to the United States Constitution, we have a First Amendment right to peaceably assemble and to state our grievances to our government. Historically though, uh, certain groups have been given more rights than others. Um, if we go back to uh, the Dred Scott case, I think that's important because it, it permeates the ethos of American uh, government interaction with people of color, especially African Americans. So when we gather, uh, and things get a little tense immediately, it, it is characterized as a riot. Uh, when some of us are gathering for peace, peaceful reasons, we have thought of and referred to as a mob. What I would ask uh, Chief Cologne and Sheriff Mina is to look at the much bigger picture, which does not start with the police department, but it certainly by no means excludes law enforcement. And that is, when you look at a man of color, black, Hispanic, whatever, do you see a citizen first or do you see a suspect? Because that governs, that colors how you're going to interact with that person. Now we know that, that for the most part, all of these uh, demonstrations, protests have been peaceful. We also know that there's always going to be outliers who come to these gatherings for the wrong reasons. We also know that there are people on the other side of the issues that Black Lives Matter is trying to elevate who are intentionally doing things to sabotage the credibility of the movement. We have to take all of those things into consideration. Lastly, I would, I would say, well, okay, that's those are- No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, Jerry, I'm sorry. You got a last comment. No, lastly, I would say, this is not a police problem. This is a society problem. Uh, bias and, and discrimination happens with banking, but if it's the banker, that means I'm not getting the loan. If it's the boss who's interviewing for a job, when he gets it wrong, I'm not getting the job. If it's the broker, I'm not getting the house. But if it's a law enforcement officer, I'm not going to live. It's a matter of life and death. This is what Black Lives Matter is about. Um, I know as we get to the end of, of our hour, um, just two questions I was going to, not for response, is to share with you that I'm hoping that the chief and the sheriff will take advantage of Kevin Anderson, who talked to me extensively for about an hour on de-escalation training. He does a lot of training all over the country, and I think it's a wealth of information, so you may want to tap into him now that you have met him. And the same with Jerry Gurley. Jerry and I talked about the divine journey, if I got that right. Sure. And so maybe talk about that some other time. So let me ask each of the panelists to take a minute and say whatever it is that you want to say, quote, as closing arguments and closing thoughts, not arguments, closing thoughts. So we start with always uh, Chief Ralone, since you're the closest to the mic on me. So these are the type of discussion. Thank you very much for, for facilitating this. And these are the type of discussions that we must have. I think moving forward, um, we have to have those uncomfortable discussions or conversations about the issues that we must address. We must identify what the common ground is that we should strive to all um, uh, meet at so that we can together move forward in a positive uh, way. And we can never forget the things that have been done wrong, but we definitely, definitely need to find that common ground that we all agree with that we must all embrace moving forward. Thank you, Chief. Sheriff Mina? Yeah, so I'll just say you know, again, uh, thanks for, for having this very, very important discussion. These type of discussions need to 
to happen because I think um, just by the nature of our, our questions and our answers and some of the online chat stuff, a lot of people got some some questions answered that they didn't realize that, that we already do. And yeah, I'll just say that you know, law enforcement uh, is one of the most complex and, and difficult professions in the world. Uh, a lot of people um, won't do that job. A lot of people, frankly, can't do that job. And remember that uh, we are human too. Uh, we make mistakes just like everyone else. Uh, but the issue in law enforcement is when we make mistakes, uh, those mistakes are critical. And sometimes lives get changed forever, sometimes lives. And so as a profession, uh, we need to continue to improve. But I do want the people here on and the panelists and, and all those uh, who are uh, tuned in to know that um, you should be very thankful that you have two of the most progressive agencies in the United States uh, that are you know, doing the, the best practices and up to the latest and greatest training on de-escalation and have some of those progressive policies out there and do take input from our community. Thank you. Anderson? Yes. Um, you know, I believe that law enforcement could benefit from inviting people like uh, Mr. Gurley and I to your table. Uh, we'd like to sit down with you and to talk about some of the policies and some of the things that we're seeing out there that we don't think work for the community. Um, you know, my practice in large part is successful because uh, you guys are good for business um, and it shouldn't be that way. And, uh, you know, you have a, a group of people, uh, white and black, who are just fed up with some of the ways that business has been, have, has been run. Um, you've heard the phrase, no justice, no peace. Um, that didn't just happen overnight. There came a point where a fed up group of people, a fed up society decided, you know what, if you're not going to listen to me, you're not going to get any rest. All right. And so, you know, you're talking about coming uh, to these events where you're, you're getting bottles thrown at you and you, you, all these things are happening and people are armed. Well, you show up in at these events armed every time. And I believe it's law enforcement who uh, will activate these flash bang devices, tear gas, batons. And, um, you know, I think that you know, sometimes I think you all have to take responsibility for what's going on as well. And we can work together, but let's be together. Let's not like, you know, try to create this facade that, you know, it's, it's the community. It's the community. It's the community. I think it's everybody together. So invite us to the table. We'd like to show up for dinner to talk to you about some of the things that will work. Attorney Gary, last word. Well, I, 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 I want to echo that. I, I'm open to have conversations, especially with the sheriff and the chief. I'm right here in Orlando, downtown Orlando, uh, 117 East Marks, sweet A. Love to talk to you. Because I'd rather have these proactive conversations uh, on the front end than to be filing uh, lawsuits on the back end. It, it, it's not uh, something that I enjoy doing, but nevertheless, uh, there is this continuing problem. I will say that I don't think that we can lay the blame for what is happening nationally at the feet of law enforcement. I've said that, I genuinely believe that. I think that we have a society uh, at large uh, in terms of the entire society that is looking at a group of people in a certain way and because a, an entire group of uh, people are being devalued we are seeing the consequences or the fruit of how these people are being perceived. So that's a much larger uh, problem. It cannot be solved by law enforcement alone. You've got to have the ministers, you've got to have uh, the, the priests, you've got to have the imams, you've got to have the rabbis, you've got to have the school teachers, the scientists. It is a comprehensive issue and it's going to take a long process, but the journey of a thousand miles begins uh, with one step. And I'm prepared uh, to walk with anyone who wants to walk in that direction. Kevin, thank you for your offer. Uh, Jerry, thank you for your offer. I do want to say on behalf of the league, I'm sure Sandy, Barbara, Sue, and Saudi will tell you this, that we appreciate your, your transparency, Chief and Sheriff, and we appreciate your willingness to always come out 
and at least listen to what people have to say. And I've known both of you for many, many years and your transparency is who you are. And so I just want everybody to know that. That's, that's my little two cents about them. So I thank you. The league thanks you. Um, uh, I see Gloria on the phone, uh, uh, just come on. So I think my notes tell me to turn it back over to Sandy, Gloria, or I, I think those two ladies. So thank you again. And Gloria, uh, you, you're next, is that right. right? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. I'm going to wrap this up with just a few announcements. And I'm Gloria Picard, and I'm the other co-president of League of Women Voters of Orange County. First, I sincerely want to thank our moderator, Dr. Stone, and each of our panelists, Orange County Sheriff Mina, Orlando Peace Chief, Police Chief Rolon, and Mr. Gurley and Mr. Anderson. We appreciate having had the opportunity to hear all these different perspectives on issues that are really important to all of us in the league, men and women alike, about Black Lives Matter about law enforcement funding and consideration of adequate funding for the other services that are necessary in our community. Excessive force need for additional training. Look, this is what civil discourse, forthright civil discourse really looks like. And we have the potential we know with this kind of conversation for positive change to occur here in Orange County. So let's do have dinner together. I think it can make some significant difference. In addition, we're getting closer and closer to the very important election we all know is happening November 3rd. In addition to many candidates, there will also be amendments to our state constitution and our Orange County Charter on that ballot. So while the league is nonpartisan regarding candidates for each elected office, we do take positions on issues that we have carefully studied and that do align with our program plan of action for our league. This does include the amendments. So our next hot topics in October, second Wednesday, will address each of the state and county amendments that will appear on our Orange County ballot. You're gonna to wanna to know how to vote. You're gonna to wanna to know what positions the league takes, League of Women Voters Florida on state amendments and League of Women Voters Orange County on our local amendments. These are all very important issues. And as a league, we're out front talking about it. So our league has also been counting down the election with our 100 Days to the Vote social media campaign. Today is 55 days to the vote, the most consequential election in our lifetime. I keep saying that. And this is part of our Get Out the Vote campaign with many opportunities for you as league members and in the community to volunteer. You need to join the league to volunteer in our activities, but that's a simple thing to do at lwvoc.org if you're not yet a member. We need many, many more warriors to do all the work that we've signed up to do. So most of these activities you can do from the comfort of your own home, such as texting, sharing on your own social media, or safely putting signs out and posters out in local communities if you're willing to leave your house. We've restarted face-to-face -face voter registration on a limited case-by-case -case basis, and we're using fully CDC compliance safety protocols that we're putting in place, including those um, face shields that will be, be available um, for us to use. We're gonna be staffing four precincts on November the 3rd with all volunteers. You know, typically we do one precinct. This time, this election is so important to this league and to our community that we're staffing four with 100% volunteers. We don't, those individuals don't get paid for it. We do get some revenue to our league to help us carry on all the many other activities that we're gonna be doing to support um, Get Out the Vote for this election. We're also gonna be training some additional volunteers to loan out to other precincts. So if you wanna volunteer to still be able to work at the polls on November 3rd, you have an opportunity with us. So go online and to our website, lwvoc.org Look through that long list of volunteer opportunities that are growing every day. Find your place and get involved. Please share the message, how important it is for everybody you know to vote. Sharing is caring, we like to say at the League. So look up League of Women Voters, Orange County, on your Facebook page, on Instagram, and share our 100 Days to the Vote messages along with the many other messages we have there for you to share. Um, it's really important every day that we put the message out, that's more people that we will pull into the fold
to be sure they get to the polls before or on November 3rd. Our message is vote early. It's safe to vote by mail. If you're going to vote in person, please go to the polls early and vote early. There will be long lines, we can assure you, on the last day of early voting and definitely at the polls on November 3rd. So thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you so much to our um, presenters and our panelists and to our moderator, to certainly to Sue and Barbara for putting this together. I'm, I don't know what to say. I found this incredibly inspirational about the things that are happening right here in our community. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon.